Hi, everybody. Welcome to this episode of Taxel Insiders. Um, I'm Brian Seidensticker, uh, CEO of, of Taxel Resources. And today, uh, we actually have uh, Jesse Loomis. He's the CEO of, of Bid for Assets, which is a um, online auction platform for tax sales. Um, I just learned for also for uh, standard foreclosure auctions now uh, nationwide. Um, welcome, Jesse. Glad to have you. Thanks for having me. So, um, Jesse, I kind of have two favorite questions I typically ask folks, um, but uh, to kind of start, I guess, tell us a little bit about your, your background. How did you get into tax sales and, and bid for assets? Yeah, I guess you could say I sort of accidentally got into, uh, into this industry. You know, I, I <laughs> came out of college in the, uh, the post 9-11 recession, and I was just really looking for a job. I was trying to crack into the field of marketing, and uh, I was selling stuff on eBay as sort of my side hustle to, uh, you know, to pay the bills. And I, I found a, a job posting for this online auction site for an entry-level marketing job. I'd obviously never heard of Bid for Assets and uh, wound up getting the job. And uh, uh, I really enjoyed what we do. Uh, you know, my, my early focus was on marketing federally forfeited and tax defaulted properties. Um, I kind of came up through the ranks, uh, was promoted uh, six times over the next 10 years. And uh, about six years ago, I became a CEO of the company. So I've been doing this about 16 and a half years now. And it's, it's definitely a passion project for me. Wow, uh, rose rose quickly to the rank of CEO. Um, so what, um, I guess, as far as, I want to dive a little bit into tax deeds um, and why they're different than other type of deeds real quick, and then we'll, we'll kind of talk about you know, some of the services that Bid for Assets provides that are, that are unique. Um, so describe to me a little bit um, what a tax deed is and you know, why is it different than any other you know, deeds you get from buying a property? Sure. So a tax deed, essentially, uh, it conveys the interest of a property owner who is tax delinquent on their property directly to the, uh, oh, I, let me uh, actually just caveat this by saying I'm not an attorney and uh, nothing yeah. I say is <laughs> uh, legal advice. I'm, I'm an auction guy, so I'm sort of sharing the, uh, the benefit of my experience. But uh, yeah, it's, it's really conveying the uh, the whatever interest a party has in a property who is, uh, you know, defaulted uh, on their property taxes directly onto an auction buyer. And in different states, in some states like California, it just goes, the deed directly conveys, you know, party who lost it is deeding the property to the party who uh, essentially is purchasing at auction. Some other states it conveys, you know, it's uh, from the party who lost it through the government agency, then to the, uh, to the buyer who uh, purchased the property at auction. I mean, one of the practical differences about tax deeds is the sort of title defect that exists in many states. Uh, so in California, for example, there is a period of one year after the tax sale where the uh, party who lost their property can contest the legality of the sale on the grounds of improper noticing. So, you know, they didn't receive a notice, their property was going to auction, this is your last chance, there are legal notices that have to be placed. If the, uh, if the party who lost their property can make that argument, uh, they may be able to get the, uh, the sale uh, stayed, essentially. Uh, it's one of those things, you know, in 16 and a half years, I have seen that happen in California tax deeds zero times but it's enough to that the mere existence of it and the fact that many title companies are sort of risk averse by nature, that it creates sort of a problem for uh, investors who are immediately looking to do a full closing with title insurance. Uh, fortunately, there are attorneys who can do quiet titles. There are uh, a few vendors who, who have a, a comparable service of quieting the title, but uh, that, that's sort of one of the, the complications that investors need to be aware of when they're purchasing tax deeds. Got it, got it. So it's, um, it's, the, it's really the title insurability is the biggest difference um, in most states, I guess, as, as far as the, you know, you're getting ownership of what kind of extra garbage comes with that deed compared to, you know, typically when you buy a piece of property through a realtor at a standard closing, you get a, a warranty deed, right? And that warranty right. deed allows that the title insurance company to provide title insurance and tax deeds, it sounds like comes with that, that um, 
um, you know, this is a real technical term, but the garbage uh, from a title perspective that needs to be addressed. And that, that garbage is, you know, varies by state, but it's stuff like you mentioned in California where it's the ability for the prior owner to contest it, right? And that makes title insurance companies nervous, right? So um, investors obviously need to be aware of that as they're buying these you know, through any platform, bid for assets or any any online or, or live platform of, of the potential title defects that come along with it. Does that sound right? Yeah, yeah. That's the title defects, and then another consideration is that when you you know buy a property from a real estate agent and you have a full closing you're pretty much guaranteed uh, with part of the title insurance to have clear title. So uh, tax deeds don't always wipe everything off the title. So we did a uh, uh, bid for assets conducted Detroit's Wayne County, Michigan's tax sale for three years, 2010, 11, and 12. It's sort of the, the peak of the subprime mortgage crisis. So one of the things that were a real problem on those tax deeds was open water bills were not expunged. And you might think, well, and, you know, an open water bills, how much is that really going to be? Well, a lot of people who were upset about losing their properties turned all the faucets on, turned the basement into an ice skating rink. And I've actually seen, you know, people bought houses for a few thousand dollars and they had open water bills that exceeded $20,000 and that wow. conveyed with the, uh, with the tax deed. So you have to know, uh, you know, in like Los Angeles County, weed abatement is big. They, they very frequently send people out, they find a dandelion on your property, they pick it, they you know, put, a, put a little assessment for that. So you, you really have to know market by market what kind of things are not expunged in the tax sale process and are gonna convey with the tax deeds so that you can research those things as part of your due diligence. Got it. And you, um, I'm kind of jumping a little ahead here, but um, you, you hit on it perfectly is the fact of doing that due diligence. And typically when people think about that is, is what, you know, is the property there? You know, is it, is it, uh, does it have a structure or not? It's more physical uh, due diligence. And uh, now we're talking about more title due diligence and, and it does, it varies, you know, by state and a lot of times county to county of what other stuff has a habit of sticking with that property and knowing what that is. So for example, like you said, in Wayne County, Michigan, those water bills, that should be part of your due diligence in, in Detroit's tax sale auction, figuring out what those past you know, water bill is or are and making sure you account for that because you're, you're going to be responsible for, for it after the auction, right? Um, so it's due diligence, due diligence, due diligence, right? It is. And I, I wish I could say it were uh, an easier process. Uh, it's, you know, title companies are able to sell these title searches and all these services because finding everything that's out there on title is not easy. I mean, you can go to the recorder's office, they may have recorded liens on a property as part of your due diligence, but many of them are unrecorded. Many of them, uh, you know, may be recorded during the, uh, uh, I've seen properties where liens were attached while the property was up for auction and someone did, you know, research 30 days before the auction. And then in those 30 days, something else was attached. And, uh, you know, they, they did good faith effort on their due diligence, but it, you know, it literally popped onto the title at the last minute. So it's just, it's, there's no standardization in the industry. Uh, every county does things differently. Things are recorded, unrecorded. They're, you know, uh, code violations can be done by the city. They can be done by the county. They can be done by code compliance. There, it's just, there's so much to look for that it's easy to miss things uh, as part of your due diligence. And, you know, I gave the example of a $20,000 water bill. You miss one of those, it's going to ruin your morning. It's going <laughs> yeah. to basically take uh, your profit and turn you upside down on a property. Real quick, huh? Um, yeah, it's, it's so I guess to kind of, um, we, we go into a uh, tile insurance piece in, in a lot more detail in several other episodes. So I don't want to steal the thunder from those episodes too much, but um, a short summary is is there's there's options for getting insurable title out there um you know most common would be you know quiet title suits that are filed um the other one would be there's you know statutorily there's you know times you can wait uh florida you can wait four years sounds like you know in in california you can wait a year um and then there's uh, this other option um there's different names for it but i call title certification or services that say you know 
similar to a quiet title um, suit, but it's not an actual lawsuit where a service comes in and says, yep, the county did everything they did they were supposed to. And some title insurance companies are comfortable with that. But I think one of the biggest false um, um, assumptions out there, investors is saying, okay, yeah, I'm going to buy this property and it comes with this garbage on title, but I'll just file a quiet title suit and it'll get rid of all that stuff. And in reality, it gets rid of, of, of a piece of it, but there's a set of liens like you're hitting at, Jesse, is those don't go away even with a quiet title suit and no matter what you do. In some cases, you can negotiate with the counties, uh, but that needs to be accounted for. So definitely research that and in your due diligence to make sure these other fines um, and liens that, that don't get um, expunged by the, 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 the foreclosure um, that you're accounting for them and, and ultimately your total cost um, to, to, to acquire the property, right? Yeah, definitely. There's, there's, like you said, there's the title defect side, which is easier to get rid of. And then there's also the sort of liens and what's outstanding on the property. And that's sort of the, the more of the art form of finding all those things from all these agencies before you bid on a property. Right, exactly. Well, no, uh, you know, title isn't isn't your uh, expertise, so I won't go too far down that rubble hole uh, with you, Jesse. But um, and you, you sent over a couple of slides, so I'm going to pull those up for everybody here, real quick. Um, I guess the um, yeah, the, the first question um, that you know, you help and answer here is is really just you know, where where can investors buy tax deeds? I know they're not, you know, they're, they're not available in every state, but where exactly can, can investors find these? Sure. So uh, there's a number of different ways that uh, investors find these. So obviously in the tax deed states, and so uh, some of the, uh, the, the red states on that uh, diagram there would be examples of uh, tax deed states. They simply hold tax deed auctions. There's no tax lien sales. It's just you don't pay your property taxes for X number of years and, uh, and the property itself will be auctioned in an annual tax sale. So California, Washington, Utah, Virginia, these states all just, there's uh, different, different periods of time in Washington. It's three years. California has one of the longest periods. It's uh, five years. You don't pay your property taxes for five years in California they hold an auction and they auction that property. So that's a, a common way to find property. Uh, there's also redeemable deed sales where if uh, uh, you, the, you purchase the, uh, the redeemable deed, people don't reimburse you within that period of time, then you'll end up with the title to the property. Um, tax lien investors do sometimes end up with tax deeds. Often they don't want to. They, you know, I liken uh, tax lien investors to more like banks. They want the interest. They don't want to end up with be in the business of owning real estate. But if uh, uh, they own your tax lien, it gets past some maturity date and uh, people have not, the property owner has not reimbursed you. If you want to try and recoup something from your investment, then you essentially go through a process of foreclosing and taking back the uh, tax deed. And uh, many of those type of parties sell tax deeds uh, on the open market as well. There's certainly a secondary marketplace for this. And then there's uh, over-the-counter properties. Um, so counties do over-the-counter properties. If you're looking for these sort of deals, it sort of helps to learn the sort of state-by-state -state lingo because it really varies state-by-state -state how the over-the-counter is handled. So California cannot, never does any kind of over-the-counter property. They never take title. If it doesn't sell in a public auction, it can roll into a future public auction. That's the only way they can sell it. In Washington, which is another state that Bid for Assets works with a lot, if it doesn't sell at the tax sale, they take it back and they refer to it as tax title property. In Pennsylvania, they typically refer to it as repository property. In Florida, I hear it called uh, lands available a lot. There are a few states in the Midwest that refer to it as over-the-counter tax deeds. So it's sort of the same concept in a lot of places, but uh, you know, referred to differently. If the property doesn't sell at the tax sale, the county takes it back and then they can go about, uh, in some cases they can sell it to uh, however they choose. In other cases, they may have to bring it to another public auction. The quality of over-the-counter properties, as you can imagine, tends not to be uh, super high quality properties usually properties that, uh, that have some marketability are going to sell in a tax sale because the minimum bids are pretty nominal. 
uh, considering that it's just based on the uh, outstanding taxes on the property. Got it. So, so if I'm an investor looking for a tax deed, obviously I can attend tax deed auctions in these red and blue states, um, or if I, I'm okay with the redemption period, I can attend the auctions in those yellow states on there. But I'm not limited to those states, like you said, the over-the-counter parcels and that that term that the various states or counties use varies. But in a lot of the lean states, I can still acquire a tax deed directly from the county. Um, I just need to ask the right questions to the right department. And, and there are some counties where they don't offer that or some states that maybe not don't offer that at all. Um, but don't be uh, don't assume just because it's a lean state, I'll never be able to acquire a tax deed from the from the county. Right. And Arizona is Arizona is a good example of that. I mean, Arizona is a lean state, but then they do get uh, these lists of over the counter tax deeds. Sometimes they just post it on their website. Sometimes they take it to uh, an auction or an online auction. You know, it's a lot of smaller desert lots, as you might expect. It's not a place you're going to go buy houses or, or high valued property. But uh, it's definitely a lean state with a lot of, of over the counter properties. I mean, really, and then within the deed states, the auctions tend to be a real mix of live auctions and online auctions. So some states like uh, California have almost entirely come to an online auction format. Bid for Assets did the, uh, the first online tax sale in the US back in the year 2000 for a Southern California County, a Mojave Desert Area County that was only selling about 58% of their property at their live sale because there's only so much desert land that their local buyers would absorb. Uh, and so in taking it online in the year 2000, the first online sale got 58% sold up to 95% sold. And so much of the rest of the state followed suit. And I think there's, uh, of the 58 counties in California at the beginning of this year, I think there were only five who had never done a sale on bid for assets and two more of those counties with COVID had decided to take their sale online because they really didn't want to gather at the courthouse. So virtually the whole state is online. A state like Arkansas has never had, to my knowledge, an online sale. They're still holding out. They're postponing and canceling because of COVID where they need to, but they are just adamant on having their auctions be, you know, at the courthouse or a ballroom and doing their sales live. Got it. Got it. Now you mentioned uh, bid for assets getting started back in 2000. So um, give me a little more history about bid for assets and, and exactly, you know, how does bid for assets um, come into this industry? Like how does it work into the industry? Sure. So uh, bid for assets was incorporated in 1999. This is when eBay was really getting off the ground and our founders were standing uh, in the snow at a, a foreclosure auction in Baltimore, Maryland, you know, wondering why if uh, eBay could sell Beanie Babies and used jeans and all sorts of that stuff, why couldn't real estate be sold in the same way as opposed to having to have everyone standing out there? So uh, they, uh, you know, built this platform designed to be, you know, for higher valued assets. And then sometimes it's, it's good to be lucky and to have a really good timing. The U.S. Marshal Service and Department of Justice were looking to add an online auction component to their asset forfeiture program. A lot of restitution cases, a lot of cases where the proceeds go to benefit law enforcement. They had a very strong incentive to bring a larger audience to their auction and generate more proceeds from the sale. So Bid for Assets sort of got its start as the first online auction site that was on a federal GSA schedule and did the first federal forfeiture auctions for the U.S. Marshal Service. As I mentioned, this, uh, this county in Southern California heard about what we were doing. And in 2000, we also did the, uh, the first online tax sale. And we've pioneered uh, online tax sales in a number of states. We do about 75% of the tax sales in California, half the sales in the state of Washington, up to about a third of the counties in Nevada. We do uh, some sales in Idaho, uh, South Carolina, Virginia, Missouri. Um, you know, it tends to be especially the, uh, the larger counties properties which have the most incentive to take their, their process online. I mean, you can wonder sometimes why are there still holdouts? Why are counties, you know, still not coming online when there's so many benefits and our service doesn't cost counties anything? You know, to give an example, I met a treasurer at a conference last year in Washington. Uh, this is a 
county population, 2,300 people. And I said, so tell me about your uh, tax sales. She said, well, in the last seven years, I've had one parcel. Okay, I can understand why it's not, not even worth your time to look at, uh, spend the hour to do a demo and look at taking your tax sale online. It's such a de minimis amount of your, of your revenues. Most of the counties, you know, Seattle and Yakima and uh, uh, these counties that have a, a fair number of properties have taken their process online. To, uh, to generate more proceeds. Coming out of COVID, uh, for the first time, we actually had sheriffs calling me up and saying, you know, uh, our foreclosure auctions, which are typically, you know, weekly or monthly, uh, you know, we've had to shut these down and it's affecting uh, uh, a lot of parties who, uh, you know, these, these sales need to continue. The banks need to uh, cash out. The attorneys need to keep the sales going. Um, so could bid for assets help us conduct sheriff sales, foreclosure auctions? And so we just pioneered the first sheriff sale in, uh, in the state of Pennsylvania. And so their auction usually had 10 to 12 local bidders, you know, coming every month and bidding on the same group of properties. So in our first auction uh, that we just, the first online foreclosure auction that we did in the state of Pennsylvania had 113 bidders who put a deposit in escrow. So a tenfold increase in uh, in number of participants, fourfold increase in the number of properties that sold third party, um, and now three other counties in Pennsylvania have vowed to come on. Uh, several have already signed contracts starting in January. So, uh, you know, Excellent. we we work with the private sector. We work with a number of uh, tax lien funds. We do serve as a place for people to uh, come on and sell their tax deeds, whether they're tax deed investors who buy properties to turn around and sell it as a profit, or we do work with tax lien funds who never wanted to end up with the property in the first place, but you know the property didn't redeem. Now they end up with some property. We even have a category called $1 no reserve properties. So you can, uh, if you really want a property sold, you can put it up for a dollar and let it ride. Whatever it goes for, it goes for. So we have some tax lien funds who use that and our tax lien funds like that they can, you know, be sort of guaranteed to sell the property and cash out quickly. But, uh, you know, working with the public sector, especially county government, has really been uh, my focus as CEO. It's what I think we do better than anyone. It's where to be. We don't make money doing other things. You know, there are a few other um, online auction sites that service online tax sales. Some of them provide, you know, legal services. They specialize in noticing. They make their revenues that way. One of the players um, makes their money doing tax collection software. All I focus Bid for Assets on is selling property. We're just transacting the auctions and the related services around that, such as deposits, funds, collection of vesting info. But uh, that, that's really where our focus is. I want to be the place where the government sells real estate. Got it. Got it. So you um, obviously you host auctions for counties and jurisdictions, you know, nationwide. And you mentioned you do that for private sales as well. Now on the on the I'll say the jurisdiction side, it's it's typically a, a tax deed, or you mentioned that first online sheriff sale. Um, those are probably more traditional uh, warranty deeds or special warranty deeds. On the private side, are, are those warranty deeds or are they tax deeds or they quick claim deeds? Um, are, is it a mixture of everything? It is that's a mixture. Being Okay, yeah. so, yeah, so the, definitely. Uh, go, sorry, sorry. The, the tax lien. The tax lien funds uh, tend to like quick claim deeds. Uh, they don't necessarily want to spend a lot more money on this property because they never wanted to end up with it in the first place. So it's sort of you know we'll put it up for a dollar and you know do your due diligence and uh, you know there may be some outstanding things on the property, but we're willing to take whatever we get for it. Especially some of the uh, the wholesalers the you know, we have groups who renovate properties, place tenants, put in property management, sell cash flow and rental properties. Some of the tax deed investors and the wholesalers sell properties on our site, you know, with warranty deeds and, and clear title and title insurance. So it is a real, a real mix from the private sector. Got it. Got it. So from the investor buyer's perspective, definitely look at each um, auction or property uh, to make sure what type of deed is being conveyed before you just buy one and assuming that it's going to come with clear title, correct? Yes, definitely. Please always, whether it's bid for assets or anywhere else, 
read the terms on the auction it is so important to know what you're getting in yourself into what you're responsible for uh you know never never go in with with the sort of blanket assumptions exactly that's a uh, pretty good caveat in our next section uh jesse because uh due diligence due diligence you know due diligence is all and, and not only from a the title perspective we talked about, but I'm sure you've seen some crazy situations, you know, just from a, a physical uh, due diligence standpoint uh, of folks buying some crazy stuff out there. So what are, what are some of the craziest situations you've come across or you've seen um, of folks buying properties, you know, online? Yeah, unfortunately, I, I have seen, you know, over the last 16 years, a, a lot of cases of people who sort of buy first due diligence second and then come back, you know, upset by the fact that they, uh, they bought a property from a tax sale that was, uh, you know, didn't have a lot of value. Uh, you know, remember, there's a reason why properties go to tax sale a lot of the time. I mean, uh, you're talking about, especially in a state like California, where, you know, property values are pretty strong and it takes five years for non-payment of taxes to lose a property. There are some very junky properties that come into sales. I mean, I've seen one foot by hundred foot strips I saw one property that was in a, you know, in a nice commercial area, but if you look at it on GIS or on a plat map, it's a two foot by two foot manhole cover is what the actual property was. <laughs> I've seen a lot of underwater properties. Usually in, in real estate, when you talk about underwater property, it refers to the, uh, you know, the mortgage being higher than the market price of the property. In tax sales, underwater can mean, you know, Jack Cousteau is going to have to go do your survey on this property. I mean, there are properties that are now at the bottom of, you know, rivers and harbors that are just that piece of land is deeded. And the fact that it's covered in water hasn't changed that fact. It explains why someone stopped paying their taxes on the property. But this is, you know, it's a, it's a pro public auction is a process governed by state law. The, uh, you know, no one's evaluating bid for assets and the county are not evaluating these properties and saying, you know, be careful, this one may not be very good. So this, this slide that you have up is kind of a, a heartbreaking example. Uh, these are the first two properties that one a particular buyer purchased in tax sale. And uh, so these two are, are from a single California uh, tax sale. And, uh, you know, this, this bidder contacted us uh, a few months after the auction when uh, he sort of did his due diligence more and he acknowledged he really didn't do a lot of due diligence before he bought it. And he said, my God, you know, I just spent $25,000 and I'm realizing, uh, you know, these properties aren't, aren't really have a lot of value here. And so the left property you can see, it's like a, a swampy mass in the middle of an agricultural area. So it's a, a little piece of that property clearly doesn't look like it's ever going to have a lot of functionality. The property on the right, he probably looked at on Google Maps. And if you look at that from space, it probably looks pretty good. It's a suburban lot. You got a power pole right there. There's houses across the street. Um, that property looks like it could have some, some value. But, you know, all I did was plug it into Google Street View. And you can see that, uh, you know, the topography, the slope of the property is going to pose a, a major challenge for development. I mean, it's basically on the side of a really steep hill. And, uh, you know, it's, it's heartbreaking to see that this guy spent, you know, over $25,000 thinking he got a, a good couple of properties. But, you know, again, this took me two minutes to plug these properties into GIS, into Google Maps, and to evaluate that these are not properties I would have spent any money on. Um, so you've got to do your due diligence. You know, tax sales are a great opportunity. There, if you think about it, they're really the only way that I'm familiar with that real estate is sold where the price or the minimum bid has nothing to do with the market value of a property. Every other way, foreclosure auctions, the attorneys are setting upset price, federal seizures are based on appraisals, REO auctions are based on appraisals. Open market sales are obviously profit motivated. Like the minimum bid on these things are just, this is how much taxes are owed. And the county doesn't even care in most cases if it goes for most of that because they don't get to keep those excess proceeds. So you have really nominal minimum bids. That's a great way to go buy property. The downside is it's not a particularly easy or buyer friendly way to buy property. Right. I mean, a lot of these sales, that's the whole premise of your business is that there's just the county puts out lists of parcel numbers and you've got to go evaluate 
what it is. And so, uh, you know, tax sale resources provides these, these lists that help you take a parcel number and turn it into a deep understanding of what that property actually is. And is it something you want to bid on and how much is the property worth? So if you're not willing to spend the time to, you know, go through a list of properties, knowing that a lot of them are going to get pulled when people pay the taxes at the last minute, knowing that you're going to get outbid on a lot of them. If you don't want to invest that time and energy, don't buy tax sale properties. Get a real estate agent, buy it the traditional way. You're going to pay market price. But tax sales are a great opportunity to get discounted property if you want to take the time and energy and associated expenses with researching a bunch of properties. Excellent. Excellent. Thanks, Jesse. Um, I don't know if you want to dive into any, you put these uh, couple slides together. Um, obviously, due diligence, due diligence, due diligence, due diligence. Um, but any, any other advice? Yeah, I mean, my, my two pieces of advice that I give uh, uh, new investors are one, the, uh, the due diligence piece, which we talked about, and two, have an exit strategy. And I, I really can't emphasize this enough. When the uh, subprime mortgage crisis was really taking off, you know, around uh, 2007 or so, um, there were companies that were buying thousands of properties from the big banks and Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And so uh, there was a big company out of Texas that was buying a lot of these properties. Myself and our CEO at the time, we made a, a day trip from Washington, D.C. to Texas to go just have a one-hour meeting with this company and, uh, you know, meet them and see if we could sell some property for them. And so we're sitting with them in their boardroom and uh, my predecessor asked them, he said, what do you look for in a buyer when you're marketing these properties? And he said, other than having the funds to complete the sale, what we really wanna see is a clear exit strategy. We hear one of two things from buyers when they make us an offer on a property. Either they'll say, wow, you have a $10,000 house, how can I go wrong? I'll, you know, I'll take it. Or they say, I'm going to offer you $10,000 on this property because I'm going to put another $10,000 into rehabbing it. My agent's going to take $3,000. I want to make $12,000. So this is where I have to be to, you know, cash out, make a profit in 60 to 90 days, and then I'll come back and buy another one off you. They want buyer number two. They don't want to sell property to buyer number one, even if they're ready to write a check on it because those guys always end up unhappy with what they've purchased. We have it happen all the time that people come in, they buy a tax sell property, they come back two years later and say, I'm ready to sell it on bid for assets at a loss. I don't know what I was thinking. When you bid $10,000 on a tax sale property, have a plan for why you're bidding 10,000 and how you're gonna make money on that property. A common misconception I hear from people is owning real estate makes you money. Owning real estate only makes you money if you're somehow monetizing it. If you've got a tenant paying for it, if you've got a billboard on it, if you're you know, owner financing it, people are making payments, then you're monetizing the property and it's making you money. Otherwise, owning real estate doesn't make you money, it costs you money. You're paying taxes, you're mowing the lawn, you're maintaining it, you gotta make sure people aren't breaking into it if there's a structure. Owning real estate costs you money. So have a plan for how you're going to monetize it before you bid on that property. And if you don't have a clear path to making money on that property, don't bid because long-term it's not going to work out for you. So Excellent. do your due diligence and buy with purpose, please. Do due diligence and buy with purpose. And that purpose is where um, that the lean side or the, the title side of it comes in, right? You may have a plan from a physical perspective, but if you don't do, again, your due diligence to you know, figure out what the, the title piece of it is, your plan may fall apart when you figure out how much it's going to cost to realize that that purpose. Um, but uh, Jesse, um, this has been excellent information. Um, I appreciate, uh, we appreciate your time today. Um, you know, definitely hope to have you back sometime soon. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share? Um. No, I, I just want to, you know, thank you and your team for the work that you do. Uh, you know, this is very much a data business and uh, tax sale industry really needs reliable data. And it's something it's really struggled with. And I, you know, I appreciate the great work that you and your team do to bring 
you know, reliable data to the tax sale industry. So I'm very thankful that we have you, you and your team. <laughs> well, thanks, Jesse. I appreciate that. Well, thank you again and um, talk soon. Thanks so much. Take care.